I joined in 2016. I joined at the time mainly because of the way my job was and the way that the rent, rental and housing market was is that we really could, my husband and I couldn't really afford to rent anymore, but we also couldn't afford because of the rent to put money aside in order to uh, have a down payment for a house to get like a lower, lower mortgage, more affordable mortgage. That mixed with the fact that I was kind of at a to me, at the time, dead-end job, I would have had to have either started completely over, gone right back to school again. I already had associates in something I just didn't pursue after I got it. Um, and it just, it wouldn't have worked starting from zero again, um, especially with us trying to start a family the whole nine yards, couldn't afford to have a child. So it's just, everything added up to that the military was going to be the most beneficial for our family and beneficial for our future. Uh, my husband was prior service, uh, so that also helped with him, A, being on board, and B, uh, helping me with that decision. I have been in the Air Force for three and a half years. I am a senior airman and recently found out that I have been selected for staff sergeant. So with my line number, probably March, April is when I should so on. We'll see. My career is weather. The AFSC is 1W0X1, the X standing for whatever level you're at. So when, as far as apprentice, journeyman, so on and so forth, currently I'm a 1W051, which is a journeyman. So I actually signed up in the depth for weather. Um, I had originally joined with the idea of being a animal handler, or excuse me, dog handler with the security forces, having been animal control with along with the police force before I joined, and then quickly decided no. But I tried to do linguist, didn't make it, missed it by one point. So my follow-up was weather. So I came in knowing I was joining weather. Originally, I had wanted to actually be in linguistics. Unfortunately, when I took the D-Lab, which is the test you specifically have to make to take in order to be in linguists, I missed it by one little point. So I was unable to do that. And you have to wait, I believe it was six months in order to retest. And I just couldn't wait six more months. I, I needed to go. Um, so whether it was my follow-up, came up on the thing and here we go. So I signed a six-year contract. I joined as an A1C because of my prior uh, college. I had an associate, so I didn't need to sign up for a six-year, but I did because <laughs> I don't know why, but I did, yes. Oh, tech school was located in lovely Big Biloxi, Mississippi at Keesler Air Force Base. So nice weather. So when I went through, it was perfect timing where I was there from the end of April until the end of November. From what I've understood is when I was there, it was the shorter or longer time frame. I know the change is different now, uh, It's but when I was there, it was eight, eight-ish months. Um, I know that if you're there longer or different timing where you're there during Christmas, and it can actually be longer for you because of Exodus. And then I believe also that the curriculum has changed since I was there. It's longer, I think by like a month or so, or it's shorter, it's short. But when I went, it was eight months long. Okay, so tech school. I hated tech school. Not necessarily because of the schooling itself, although, um, or the way that the area is. If you get this job, and you go to Keesler and you, that's where your I mean that's where your tech school is going to be enjoy the area the base itself is awesome the area is awesome even with the area restrictions because of AETC which is the education it's actually a nice area and I wish I could get stationed there or at least TDY there or something so I can better enjoy it so when I went to tech school it was miserable for me so I joined pretty old in comparison to how most people do, uh, when they join I was 27 years old or by the time I got to tech school 28 living on my own. I've been actively having a job since I was 15, 16, and I was used to living on my own, having my own space, having my husband living with me, and that was not the case once I got the tech school. And then the restrictions, of course, and everything like that, when someone else got in trouble, the whole dang triangle, which is the area of where you're at for Kiesler, where you're staying in the dorms, which I was in the Connor dorm, it's just everybody got in trouble for one person's mistakes, which I understand, but at the same time, it's so disheartening when you're weather and you're there for so long, and you have to deal with all the bull crap. I personally had roommates who were personnel, so I maybe dealt with them a month and a half, and then I got a new roommate. Month and a half, got a new roommate, where other people were kind of, I guess, blessed in the sense of that they had the same person, so they knew the person, where they was weather with weather, so it was the same person at least the whole time, or if not, 
most of the time. I didn't get a weather person until the very end of, I think, the last two months of mine. But anyway, uh, tech school itself, the actual schooling. So because, like I said before, because of my age, I hadn't been in, in college or high school, obviously, for quite some time. Getting back into the actual classroom and for how long it is mentality, you're getting, you're basically getting an associate's within an eight front, uh, you know, an eight month period. It's a lot of schooling, it's a long hours, and I had a really rough time with it, really rough time. And it didn't help that the class I was in with was full of guys who were just got it like that. I was literally the only person who didn't get an A in the class. Granted, I got like a B plus, but still, the whole experience was very disheartening for me. And I was there, wasn't able to have my husband there because or because of he had a job back home, so no big deal. But also because I didn't have my husband there, so he was about eight nine hours away. Didn't have that support like other uh, married couples did, where they were separate, which is when they're there, but they're able to live on base or live in housing with their spouse or their children if you had children. I did not do that nor was I really able to because I didn't have an 85% at that time. So it's just really rough. Learning was really rough. I, every time I felt like I was doing good, my grades didn't even count towards my main grade. The tests that actually did count, I struggled. I failed out. I didn't fail out. I failed once, one test. That was so disheartening. But then I restudied and passed it. But still, it's just, it's a long time to be in one space. As far as with the restrictions of the education uh, group and everything like that. So it's just, I had a miserable time, but I also know people who had a wonderful time and loved learning. It's just rough. <laughs> it can be very rough, but make the fun of it is all I can say. Just enjoy your time there as much as you can. You're stuck there, so you might as well, right? So with weather, with weather, we can go to pretty much any base. So if there's an, pretty much every Air Force base, I say pretty much because I can't be 100% sure, but every Air Force base and just about every Army base. Army doesn't have a weather division. We do their weather. So we are actually are the people who are at the Army bases providing their weather. We're the ones being deployed out with the Army people to do their weather while they're deployed. Also do that with ourselves, uh, with our own teammates as far as Air Force is concerned. So we can pretty much go anywhere. If there's a base there, there's weather there in one form or another. Woo! I love this question. So the one thing that I wish I knew 100% about this job, you are essential personnel. Yes, the job itself, especially if you get a weather, a weather hub job, which is what I'm at. I'm at the weather hub, uh, 21st operational weather squadron located in Germany. We are a hub. Similar to how the gentleman from the other video said that he's from a weather flight, I am the hub. So we are essential personnel, which means that we are 24-7 manned. Someone's there at all times, well, unless something's down as far as systems and we're cooped. But even then, it's a you know bare bones, someone's there regardless. Um, that means holidays, normal weekends, stuff like that that you would expect to get off as a uh, desk job as far as like personnel finance or any uh, admin or anything like that, we do not get. If you have a holiday off, it's because conveniently your day off falls on that holiday or that your squadron has made it so that you have that time off because of the holiday, which our squadron does as far as for the Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas holidays. So the job itself, for I'll speak on the weather hub. So what we do is that we provide forecast briefs and hazard charts, we'll go with that, uh, for the area of Europe and Africa. Basically what you do when, we'll go through timeline time line as far as you get there. Um, when I got there, go upstairs for out training, which is not a thing anymore, but you're upstairs in training for two months and then you come down on the floor and you produce tasks, which is the weather forecast of a specific uh, location or base. Uh, and then you, those are due every eight hours. And yes, those are due every eight hours. And they're basically letting, letting pilots or even just people at that location what their weather is going to be like. Generally speaking, was a hub, what you do is you prepare the TAF, your manager for that area approves it, you send it off to the weather flight, weather flight looks it over, gives their input or the changes, and then you make those changes and then you post it out. That's generally speaking what happens um, for your normal, I just started here job. Eventually moving on, you can become a briefer, which is basically you, you uh, provide weather briefs, uh, looking at weather, you still forecast, but you provide weather briefs for pilots. You uh, will look into the weather of where they're flying from and to, as long as it's in your area, from where they're starting, and then you build a brief based on that so that the pilots know whether they can fly or not. Following that, you can work on hazard charts, which are also part of weather briefing, which basically lets you know if there's icing, turbulence, thunderstorms, whatever that could affect briefs or that could also affect weather 
class. That's, and then also, but that's, so that's the basic people. There is an ability to be non-essential personnel within weather, where you're upstairs or what we call being staff, or you're the, pe you're the people who uh, support the squadron during normal business hours, whether it's through training, ops, dealing uh, as far as like other locations asking for coverage for our forecasting for their operations and everything like that. So there's a lot to do and th th then as far as what can be done in a weather location. As a, uh, generally speaking, however, as a new airman, single, especially if you're only at a location for two months, uh, or excuse me, <laughs> two years, with, especially with a hub, you will more than likely be mostly working a desk and producing tasks where towards the end of your time, you will be, be a briefer. And then if you're there long enough, which for me, I've almost been at my base for three years, you'll do hazard charts. This is just for my experience at our location uh, within Germany. Generally speaking, at my job, what we do is we work five five on, two off, five on, three off. So your weekends are consistently moving. You don't have weekends off necessarily unless it just perfectly times up that way. And um, you work eight-hour shifts, normally speaking. You're either a day shift person, which is from 7.30 local until 3.30 uh, p.m. Then swing shift, which is 3.30 p.m. until 11.30 p.m. And then Mid shift, which is from 11:30 p.m. until 7:30 a.m., that's generally how it goes. You can also work. There are situations like for me, for instance, our squadron is half of our squadron is deployed currently, so we are on Panama 12s, which ours is a little different. But the way that it works is that basically, as of the way our squadron has it set up, the way every other weekend's a three-day weekend, which is nice. You work 12-hour shifts. It's split between a day shift of 7:30 a.m. till 7:30 p.m. and then a night shift. 30 p.m. to 7.30 a.m. And generally speaking, you don't work more than two days in a row. Some weekends you work three days in a row, but honestly, it's not that big of a deal. On that aspect of 12s, yes, on the, on the topic of 12s, this is not normal, at least for um, most weather locations, unless you are so badly manned that you have to work 12s in order to keep the location 24-7 manned. The wing, which is, you know, big guy who takes care of everything does not like to put locations on 12s and they will you actually have your location will actually have to consistently apply to keep the 12 hour shifts going uh, unfortunately we will be on it until february because of how badly manned we are right now basic answer to the question nothing Weather doesn't specifically get any kind of certifications or anything like that that you can use in the, in the civilian world or anything like that. The follow-up answer to that is that you, because of how long you're in tech school and how much schooling you get done, you basically have an associate's when you finish tech school. I think, honestly, it was just with my tech school credits and some of my general education credits that I had already done prior. I was only two credits away from getting my CCAF once I... Uh, finished everything and finished my training and CDCs, which aren't a thing anymore. They're switching the way they do things now. But so all I had to do was clep out to leadership classes and I had an associates with the Community College of, Air, of the Air Force in meteorology. That honestly is the only thing that's been not necessarily hand given to you, but hand given to you just through you going through training and doing some extra work on the side as far as getting your general education things taken care of and your leadership classes taken care of which you can also wait and take care of an ALS but um which is airman leadership school but I didn't want to wait so so when it comes to deployments for this job recently there have been changes where um, beforehand weather flights got deployed way more often than weather hubs there has been a change however where they're flipping that and weather flights are not being deployed as often but uh, and weather hubs are being deployed way more often like I said earlier half of my squadron is gone right now on deployment I think so we're in a it, so it can change it definitely has changed as far as the tempo goes that being said if you get sent to an army location you are way more likely to deploy some locations it's six on six off where you're deployed for six months back for six months deployed for six months and back for six months um, so honestly it, it depends on the location and whether you're at a flight hub or an army location so i am actually planning on making this a 20-year career Possibly more, depending on what my situation is at that time of retirement coming up. If I'm happy with where I'm at and comfortable with my um, FSC, um, if I'm comfortable with my rank, or if I need to stay in a certain rank for a while in order to make that sweet, sweet pay raise uh, in my retirement, I will. A lot of that is based more so on I'm being a little more realistic about my age 
and about how if I do get out when my six year contract is up, I'm gonna have to start over all over again with retirement and everything like that. And you know, I'm gonna be 34 when that happens and I just, I'm not ready to do that to myself or my husband or my, or my you know, my family in general, honestly. So it's a little more on the inwardly why I wanna join or not join, stay in for that long. Honestly, as far as weather is concerned, there's so much to do with weather. There's so many different aspects of weather to go into and to experience. So touching back on the last uh, question, just don't let one aspect of the job be your sale in whether you get out or not. Selfishly wise, not even selfishly wise, I'll say stability wise, uh, I would want a non-essential personnel job. When I joined, I didn't know about it being an essential personnel job. Now that I do, especially with a young child, it kind of sucks <laughs> not being home when they're home, not being home when my husband's home. Sometimes when, especially when I'm on mids, I don't see them. I see them for maybe an hour and then I got to go to bed, um, especially on swings too. It, you know, it's just, it's really, it doesn't work. So I don't even have a specific job I would want instead of whether it's just anything that's a day job, Monday through Friday, nine to five, you know what I mean? But outside of that, honestly, I don't, I think I would trade weather. Um, I don't feel personally that I'm really great at it. I'm not, it's not my kind of nerd, but as far as the weather career field, everybody I talk to, mo most everybody I talk to, especially who have made a career out of it, love their job, love doing it, love weather. So I'm just hoping to eventually get to that point myself where I like weather. So just hoping. Okay, so I'll speak a little bit on people who are coming into weather. So, I've noticed a trend with weather that a lot of people who come here are nerds, or at least very intelligent or very confident in their intelligence and don't like question, don't like being told they're wrong. And a lot, a lot of ego gets into this, especially when, like I said earlier, as far as TAFs, when you talk to a weather flight and vice versa, I've gotten into a 30 minute conversation over the littlest thing because the person I was talking to just didn't want to drop it and didn't and their backing was better than mine. You just have to, you know, you have to pick your battles, so to speak. Um, be ready to be wrong and accept being wrong. Accept criticism. Accept uh, getting information from your, your peers and from your superior. When you get out of tech school, all that information is fresh in your head. And a lot of it too, especially when you go overseas, does not pertain to your job. So you'll be fresh out of school, fresh off the information, ready to go, ready to, to to do the weather thing, um, but be humble, honestly, and in every aspect of this job and the career, just be humble. Be kind, honestly. I know that sounds really cheesy, but just be kind to one another, especially when you're in tech school, and especially when you're in a new location. Y'all are stuck there together at least two years. Why make it miserable for yourself? Two years when it comes to a base and you know eight, eight or nine months when it comes to the tech school, just let stupid things go. Be willing to learn and learn from your mistakes. Definitely be willing to learn from your mistakes because they will happen. Weather is the biggest part of our job, but mother nature likes to do whatever the heck she wants and she gonna do it. So honestly, just whether career wise or field wise, just be humble, be ready to, I don't know how many more times I can say this. Just be ready to take criticism and learn from it. Learn from it. Don't stew. Just learn. As far as for the Air Force career, just honestly, kind of the same thing. Just let stupid stuff go. Don't stew on it. Don't hold it against people. Don't let one loc, especially this, don't let one location be the say all in how you feel about the Air Force or even just any military career. Honestly, if you're watching these and because Navy and Marines both do weather. So, I mean, we have a lot of Navy folk at our base, but just don't let one location ruin your whole experience. Um, honestly, I've known some people who let one thing, one bad supervisor or one bad situation just ruin it and they get out, which, you know, they're adults, they can choose what they want to do, but just, you know, learn from it and think it out. Just don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Think things through. Honestly, I could go on, but I'm not going to. <laughs> So, plugging wise, you can find me on Instagram under Simply Sicka. Uh, you can find me on Twitch under the same name. I dabble in playing Dead by Daylight, like I in Overwatch, like I think I know what I'm doing. Um, you can also find me on YouTube under Pop Culture Psychology. Uh, it's a project I'm a part of that I really love and would love, even if you just give it a look. Cool. Thank you for the opportunity.